our next speaker uh, is a number, another uh, Lampoon alumnus. Uh, Michael Frith is an artist and illustrator, a co the co-creator of, of Dr. Seuss books and uh, The Muppets, among other accomplishments, if you need more. Um, he will talk about Edmund March Wheelwright uh, as an adolescent, as an undergraduate, as a founder of the Lampoon and uh, a young artist. Michael. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> First have to say that um, I was uh, kind of delighted to see that up there. Um, I, uh, not the name, but the uh, little crest above it, I, I drew that. <laughs> Exactly 50 years ago. So, so that, I think, I hope, establishes my bona fides here in, in talking tonight. This is, uh, as we now discover, this is the mugshot. <clears throat> this is uh, Edmund March Wheelwright, Lampoon founder, architect of the Lampoon Castle, chief, chief architect of the city of Boston, a distinguished American. There is so much to say about him, and I've been told that I have only eight minutes uh, to say it, um, and uh, what will I do except perhaps uh, to um, proceed? I, I do want to, to comment on the mustache. I think that is just a wonderful, wonderful accomplishment, and you will, be seeing, you will be seeing more of that before this evening is out. So instead of trying to expound on all of uh, Wheelwright's uh, various accomplishments in that short time, I thought um, we would uh, talk about me. <laughs> That's me. Um, we're jumping ahead about a century, and that's me on the left, back in the days when my pants were wider at the bottom and narrower at the top. <clears throat> on the right is Ted Geisel, whom you've heard mentioned, better known as Dr. Seuss. For um, several years, we had a kind of partnership, which mostly meant uh, sitting on the floor of his living room in La Jolla, California, far, far into the night with a bottle of vodka nearby, scribbling and swapping sketches, bad puns and worse doggerel, and laughing a lot. I did have one dilemma. Ted, I said one night, uh, people keep asking me just what it is I do. What should I call myself? He looked at me gravely and replied without a beat missed, you can go on being the boy cartoonist until they start calling you the grand old man. <laughs> So let's now reimagine our subject, Ned Wheelwright, boy cartoonist. For long before he was being elevated to grand old manhood, that was what he was. And what an amazing thing it was that he was part of. As many of you know, it all began with a slight. <clears throat> this is the fellow who started it all, Ned's classmate, Ralph Curtis. There is an undergrad, you can see him glassy-eyed and frozen for the camera. But uh, soon after that, he was caught by the dancing and fluid brush of his cousin, friend, and painting companion, John Singer Sargent. Lounging on a beach in Holland, splendidly arrayed in derby, silver-headed stick, and spats, obviously this was his true persona. But in the dark winter of 1876, Ralph Curtis was miffed. A humorous piece that he and Ned's brother, Jack, had written for the Harvard Advocate had been rejected, and Curtis was an editor of The Advocate. The answer, then as now, self-publish. <laughs> One other thing attracted Curtis, an artist, to the idea was that he had heard of a new process whereby drawings could be inexpensively reproduced directly from the original. No laborious litho stones or hand engravings in between. This was a boy cartoonist's dream. Curtis quickly organized his band of seven, the Wheelwright brothers among them, to create what he presciently called their college punch. Punch would, of course, have been their model. Descended from the far more radical and dangerous satirical sheets on the continent, in particular, uh, Philippon's Le Charivari, whose artists tended to spend a lot of time in jail, Punch, calling itself the London Charivari, would have been ubiquitous in Boston's libraries, clubs, and drawing rooms. And to Ned and the boy cartoonists of the newly minted Harvard Lampoon, or Cambridge Charivari, it would have been irresistible. 
as we, their cartoonist counterparts a century later, would instantly have known the line of a Walt Kelly from an Al Cap, a Ding Darling from a Dan Dowling, a Barney Toby from a Charlie Martin, they would have consumed Tenniel, Leech, and Du Maurier and emulated them. Those are the lampooners on the left, two wheelwrights and a Curtis, the masters on the right. Not great, perhaps, but as Juvenilia goes, not terrible. Their one sheet was a hit, and they decided to keep it going. The staff expanded, and in the third issue, there appeared the first drawing by a younger undergraduate, Francis Gilbert Atwood. Among the brightest stars in Punch's galaxy was Richard Dickey Doyle, whose series Manners and Customs of Ye English was a huge hit. Proudly, the Lampoon's poster announced its new series of Doyle-esque cartoons, Manners and Customs of E. Harvard Student, the work of Frank Atwood. Clearly, Ned Wheelwright was dazzled by him. In his 70-page memoir, Lampy's Early Days, after page 50, Ned gives up any pretense at Lampoon's history and spends the rest of the book lavishing loving detail on the rise and rise of Frank Atwood as he leaves Harvard early and becomes one of the great illustrators and cartoonists of his era. The life, perhaps, that Wheelwright dreamed he might have had. Said Ned of Atwood's Doyle-esque drawings, without them, Lampy's life would indeed have been short. But there was another Doyle-esque challenge that fell not to Atwood, but to Wheelwright himself. Since 1842, with only one slight variation, <clears throat> Punch had, been, had had but one cover design. The famous concoction of Dickie Doyle's was everywhere, reproduced as doorstops, toby jugs, toast forks, teething rings. Lampy needed a face, and Ned Wheelwright took on the task of creating it. Ned's first drawing, up there on the left, a pen-wielding Lampy on a griffin did not, despite the winged beast he boarded, fly. Back to the drawing board, inspired, he wrote, 33 years later, by the teachings of Professor Moore and aided by one of Durer's woodcuts, I made a design for the cover which is essentially that used today. With a mixture of classical and medieval sentiment, it shows Lampy mounted on an arbored pegasus, ready to contend with the monsters of college life. Perhaps this was a little heads up to the future, perhaps a modest suggestion that his own place in the pantheon of Poon cartoonists not be forgotten. And Ned's hand uh, created uh, Lampy's identity in yet another way. Among the objects he lists decorating the walls of the castle's great hall in his story of the Lampoon building is E.M. Wheelwright's original drawing for his shingle, Lampy on Pegasus, which used to be placed in a window of the university hall to announce meetings of the board, as was the custom of all college organizations in the 70s. Shingles were an important part of the undergraduate life. There were innumerable student organizations, and every one of them had its shingle. In effect, they were membership certificates, and joiners could be derided for festooning their walls with them. And they were critiqued for their artistic merit. Lampies would have indeed been coveted and admired. Those were extraordinary, heady days. In the yard, those guys must have been rock stars. And their paper was not only a popular success, but a financial one as well. No wonder they dreamed of continuing their venture on after college as a national magazine. But as real life interviewed, intervened, that dream faded. Boy cartoonist and proper Bostonian just did not fit in the same sentence. A trade like architecture was at least acceptable, and that is the path that Ned Wheelwright, like so many other Lampoon cartoonists, followed. But as an aged boy cartoonist myself, I cannot believe that he ever stopped seeing the world through that particular prism, or that as the technological miracles of the Industrial Revolution multiplied and allowed the golden era of American illustration to blossom, he did not continue to be dazzled by the hands and eyes of all those great illustrators whose work was everywhere around him. Books, magazines, even the Sunday papers were bursting with the full-color fantasies of the likes of Windsor McKay and the great Cubist painter Lionel Feininger. Arthur Rackham brought trees and mountains to life. W. W. Denslow and John Neal found fanciful faces in the fantastic houses that dotted their Oz books. 
Could Ned Wheelwright have smiled at this wide-eyed, dome-hatted windmill from a Feininger Sunday page? Such images were everywhere, on paper and in the world around them, for those who looked. When I look at that whimsically faced castle on Mount Auburn Street, I don't believe that, boy, that that boy cartoonist ever quite grew up. Ned Wheelwright's lifelong attachment to the lampoon and the unbridled admiration he lavished on its artists up to his end, to me, attest to that. Perhaps one reason he was so smitten with Frank Atwood was that he was the one artist among them who persisted and became the great figure on the national stage they had all in those days of youthful glory dreamed of being. But for us today, Ned's contributions were extraordinary and perhaps more lasting, for he of that merry band of seven was the one who gave Lampy his first face, the cover that suggested the arrival of each new issue and all that it contained and his face for the ages, the little castle on Mount Auburn, that stands as a beacon, a lodestone drawing generation after generation of boy cartoonists, be they male or female, artists or writers, bloggers or video videographers, even architects, draws them into its heart, imbues them with its soul, gives them sometimes raucous voice, and sends them out into the world to change it always for the better. Thank you, Ned. <laughs>